We all know what an American is. I mean, if you said, you know, well, what's American? You know, we'd all know what an American is. We would all know what an Egyptian is. Um, we would all know what a Canadian is, um, even though they may not know what they are. But we know what a Canadian is. And, you know, we know what a comedian is, right? And um, you say, yeah, that's you, Pastor. Um, which reminds me of... Uh, it reminds me of this big wedding service. This was like a big wedding service, really, to do. And, uh, you know, the, the women were coming down in their processional, uh, the maid of honor and all the bridesmaids and a flower girl. And then this little five-year-old boy comes walking down the aisle. And every time he takes three steps, he just goes, Arr! And then he takes another three steps and look at the people and go, Arr! Finally, you get to the front and the groom said, What in the world are you doing? And he said, They told me to be the ring bear. So... So, you know, hey, we know what American is, Egyptian, Canadian, we know what a comedian is. And, uh, but when we come to this question, what is a Christian, um, that can actually cause a lot of different responses. I mean, you know, if somebody said, are you a Christian? You know, some people would say, yes, I think so. Some people would say, well, uh, yes, but... Um, some people may say, no, absolutely not. Some people may say, uh, well, what do you mean by that? And so when we look at this word Christian, it conjures up a lot of different emotions and a lot of different expressions. And some people may say, well, yeah, of course I'm a Christian because, you know, I live in America. Or some people may say, well, I went to a church once and the pastor gave a message and then at the end, all he said is if you pray a prayer, um, you know, you won't go to hell. And so I didn't want to go to hell and so I prayed that prayer. And so I guess I'm a Christian because I prayed a prayer once and Somebody might say, well, you know, when I was like 11 years old, my mom wanted me to get baptized, and I thought it was a good idea, and so I got water baptized, and, you know, I guess that must uh, be, or, you know, maybe you're of a persuasion where, you know, you went to some kind of class, a confirmation class, you know, whether six or eight weeks or however long it was, and when you came out of that, you said, well, I guess, I guess I'm a Christian now because I did that class, and and then, you know, we get confused in America, especially with all the different brands. Like, well, what brand of Christian are you? Do you believe this? Do you believe that? Uh, do you accept that? Do you not accept this? And all these kinds of things. And, uh, and unfortunately, in our culture, you will run into a real lot of people that if you ask them that question, you know, about a Christian, are you a Christian? They would say, you know what, I was, but I'm not anymore. Maybe I grew up in the church but I'm not anymore. And I've heard this so many times, and I'm sure you've heard it too. I don't like going to church because it's filled with hypocrites. And every time I hear that, I immediately have two lines of defense that come to my mind. And that is, number one, if a hypocrite is standing between you and God, the hypocrite is closer to God than you are. Right? And then the other thing is, is do you suppose that there's any hypocrites where you work? I mean, do you suppose that there's some people there that really aren't company people, they're just there for a paycheck, and isn't that kind of hypocritical? Do you stop going to work? Do you think there's some hypocrites in school? Do you think there's some hypocrites in Hollywood celebrities? Oh my goodness, you know, hey, we'll save the spotted owl, but we'll abort our children. Do you think that's hypocritical? And yet, do you say, I'm never going to go to the movies again, I'm never going to go watch another you know, TV show? And so this, this kind of, you know, when I hear this, you know, hypocrites in church, I don't go there. It really is nothing more than a cop-out and an excuse. And then there's always that question of, what is it? Is it, is it about belief? Is it about behavior? I mean, what, what is a Christian? Because, you know, you can't just believe and not have any kind of change in your behavior. But it's got to be more than just changing your behavior. And so on and on it goes. All these questions about, what is a Christian? How do we define what a Christian is? And, and then you're going to find some people that are absolutely going to hate the idea. I've even seen a bumper sticker that said, I love God. It says, kids I can't stand. And, uh, and I thought, well, if you love God, does that make you one of God's kids? Does that mean you can't stand yourself? You know, it's kind of funny. But uh, you know, actually, you know, there's, there, there's kind of in our culture today uh, of modern thought and progressiveness, and there's, there's this uh, belief that, that says this. Christians are judgmental, homophobic moralists, who think that they're the only ones that are going to heaven and secretly relish the fact that everyone else is going to hell. And unfortunately, that's a pervasive view of a lot of people outside of the church, a lot of view of uh, people outside in our society. And so here's the good news. None of these things define or accurately describe what a Christian is because there's nothing in the Bible that describes 
what a Christian is. There's absolutely no reference. As a matter of fact, there are only three references in the Bible that mention Christianity at all. It only appears in the Bible three times, and in every single term, it is a derogatory term not used by followers of Christ themselves, calling themselves Christians, but it was always outsiders calling those who followed Christ Christians. And it was a derogatory term. It was, it was kind of a, an insult. It would be like, you know, we call people who follow the Reverend Moon, we call them Moonies. And so they called Christ followers Christians as a derogatory term. And when we look at the Scriptures and we start looking at the verses that talk about Christian, we find out it's always people outside the faith talking about those inside of the faith. And when we go to the book of Acts, which is the church's history book, you know, you have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the New Testament begins with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are narrative stories of the life, the ministry, the teachings of Jesus. The very next book is the book of Acts, and that's the story of Jesus is now ascended and the church is starting to gain momentum and is starting to really take off. And we find out that the, the people who were following Jesus were actually called followers of the way. That's what they were referred to. And that reference comes from John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so they were called people of the way because Jesus referred to himself as the way. And then we know that as the church started exploding in Jerusalem, that it wasn't long until persecution broke out. And they started going after the, the, the followers, the Christians. They started persecuting them. And a bunch of them scattered everywhere. People were leaving their homes, their businesses, their families. And they were just hightailing it in any direction that they could to get away from the severe persecution that was taking place. And a bunch of them ended up going to Antioch. And so if you remember a map in your mind, you know, Jerusalem south of the Mediterranean Sea, and they would have been going off to the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and up in that northeast region in a city of Antioch, which is modern-day Turkey. And in that city of Antioch, a lot of believers began to assemble there. And the Bible says that everywhere they went, they kept preaching the Word. Because you remember, we looked at this a while ago, that the church started off as a movement and they only had one message, and that message was that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He is the Lord of life, he, and he's alive forevermore, and he gives life to those who believe in him. And so they started preaching this message of Jesus, him being resurrected, and people started getting saved. People started following Christ. Uh, Ro Romans, Greek-speaking Romans, were coming to Christ. And I'm talking about thousands. This really started exploding. So the church in Jerusalem were like, wow, you know, uh, we thought it was a Jerusalem thing, but this is going on everywhere, and it really is getting traction in Antioch. And so they got this guy by the name of Barnabas. We read about Barnabas in the book of Acts. And they say, Barnabas, we want you to go up to Antioch. We want you to check it out. We want you to encourage them and maybe teach them some things if they don't know. And so Barnabas says, I'm right on it. And, and he gets the idea, you know what, I'm going to go get this guy that just got saved, Saul of Tarsus. And, and we looked at, you know, Saul is his um, Hebrew name. His Greek name is Paul. We know him as Paul the Apostle. And he ends up writing two-thirds of the New Testament and becoming a, a great, great missionary. And so Barnabas, we pick up the story in Acts chapter 11, and it says that Barnabas left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For an entire year they met with the church and they taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so this is the first time we ever you know, historically see the mention of this word Christian or the usage of this name Christians while they were in Antioch. Now, one of the really cool things about our faith is that there are extra-biblical documents that confirm the Christian faith. In other words, it's not just Christian writers that talk about Christianity. We have historians that talk about it also. We have the Jewish historian Josephus, who mentioned a lot of things that were going on in the Christian church at the time. And we also have the Roman uh, historian Tacitus. And Tacitus writes these words after Rome burned. You remember in around 64 AD, Nero was the emperor of Rome, and a huge fire broke out in the city of Rome. The, the poorer section, about a fourth of the city burned to the ground. 
And a lot of historians believe that Nero had the fires set himself because he wanted to rebuild the glory of Rome for his own namesake. And they believe that he set the fires to Rome to burn down you know, the poorer sections, the lower income sections, and then he was going to rebuild this glorious thing. But word got out that you know, it might have been um, the emperor that did it, and so he starts looking for a scapegoat to pin it on, somebody to blame the arson on. And so um, Tacitus writes this, in his writings, he says this, Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. They were hated for their abominations because they were doing what we just did this morning. They were drinking the blood of Jesus and eating the body of Jesus. And in their minds, that was a form of cannibalism, that these people were insane, they were crazy, and they looked at them as a sect that had spun off of Judaism, and so they just hated them. And so Nero pins the blame on, on these people. But the Christians weren't the ones calling themselves Christians at this point. And he goes on and he says this. He says, Christus, from whom the name has its origin suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius uh, Pilatus. And so we know him as Pontius Pilate. Um, but here, uh, Tacitus gives him this name of Pontius Pilatus. And so you know, we see this historical document of, of, of these things. And it's funny because they called Christians Christians because of the name of Christ. They thought Christ literally was Jesus' name, that his name was Jesus Christ. There's still a lot of people that think that. And they don't realize that Christ is not a name, it's a title. It means the anointed one, Jesus, the anointed one of God. Hebrew would say Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Greek says Christ or Christos. And so they start saying, well, these people are little Christs. They're little followers of Christ. Just like we say Moonies are followers of Reverend Moon. And so it was really a, 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 a diss. It was a, a put down. It was a cut. And, uh, and this is what they started calling uh, the Christians. And, and you know, again, here's the thing. It's like you can't try to defend or define this title of Christian anywhere in the Bible. And that's why when people talk about Christianity or they talk about Christians, you can find Christians on any side of any major topic. You can find Christians on both sides of the abortion topic. You can find Christians on both sides of uh, capital punishment. You can find Christians on both sides of ecology. And on and on and on it goes. You'll find people that say, hey, I'm a Christian, but I believe this way. And other people say, well, I'm a Christian, and I believe this way. I literally, I was watching a TV evangelist one day. I kid you not, I was down in Florida visiting my brother, and they have a lot of you know television uh, programs, Bible Belt, and all that. And I was just, my brother was at work, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to watch some preaching and you know get fed and. And there was this guy, I'd never seen him before, but he was a big teller evangelist and, you know, shiny jewelry and he's doing the thing and he's got his hair in the dew. And, uh, and, and he's talking out of Malachi about how God is a fuller's soap that cleanses. And, and, and then he goes into this big talk about how there's this little organization in Israel that use all natural ingredients in the waters of, of, the, uh, of the Jordan and they're making this fuller's soap. And for a donation of like $100, you can get a bar of this soap, and it will break the power of sin in your life when you wash in faith and you give $100. And uh, I mean, like I bought like 100 boxes because, <laughs> well, I wanted to give them out as Christmas gifts, you see. And, um, but, you know, it's just crazy, you know, when you, when you look at this term Christian, and you say, what is that? And you say, well, you know what, nowhere in the Bible does it define what that is. Because followers of Christ weren't called Christians. And you say, well, what were they called? Well, really, what they were called was disciples. Now, this word begins to scare the bejeebies out of people because this word is really, really well-defined in Scripture. This word has a lot of, uh, 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 all throughout Scriptures, a lot of talking about this word. As a matter of fact, when we go back to the text that we looked at about Christians in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it said, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. 
So what they were called was disciples. And you say, well, okay, you know, what's a disciple? Well, a disciple, first of all, is a learner. A disciple is somebody who's, gonna, who's saying, I need to learn, I need to understand, I need to know what it is I believe, and I need to know why I believe what I believe. A disciple is a pupil. Somebody, again, that, that's depicting uh, studying and, and, and researching and, and digging deep. Uh, a, a disciple is an apprentice. Somebody who's modeling something after somebody else. Somebody who is learning the ropes, as it were. Um, an adherent. Somebody that's adhering to teachings or a, a, a lifestyle. And then also a follower. Somebody who's following. You see, Jesus didn't say, hey, you want to be Christians? Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. And so really, disciple and follower are much better descriptive words of who a person that puts faith in Christ actually is rather than a Christian. Because that word in our culture is so misunderstood, so overused, and yet this is what it is. And you say, well, you know, how, how, how does that look? What is, what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who literally says, what would Jesus do? You know, years ago, they came out with these little rubber name bands, and it was WWJD, what would Jesus do? And, and really, I mean, it goes deeper than that. The real thing that you're asking yourself is, what would Jesus want me to do? In other words, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do in this predicament? What would Jesus do in this time of testing? And that's what I should be doing. And so this is really depicts a disciple. A disciple is somebody who's saying, how does Jesus want me to live? How should I really live my life? How does Jesus want me to manage my relationships? And all the relationships are different. How does Jesus want me to manage finances? And what should be my attitude towards money? How does Jesus want me to live in this world in this life because that's what i should be doing that's what a disciple is a disciple is somebody that's saying what does jesus want me to do and so disciple becomes a narrower focus than christian christian is just sort of like you know well i believe but a disciple is somebody who says i believe and i'm laying a foundation and i'm laying a charted course for my life that's going to be based around what i believe so that my belief isn't going to be a fraction of my life. In other words, I have this job, I'm married to this woman, I have these children, I do this for a hobby, I, I, you know, we vacation here, and then I have faith in Christ. A disciple paints with a broad brush, and that faith in Christ encompasses how am I going to work at work? What kind of husband or wife am I going to be to my spouse? What kind of parent am I going to be to my child? Or what kind of child am I going to be to my parent? And so it starts getting a lot dicier and it starts getting a lot scarier. People hear that word disciple. Or if we say, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do a 12-week discipleship class, right off the bat, people are like, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. Because it conjures up the word discipline. And that's just a plain scary word. We don't like that word. And so let's just kind of look at a couple of scriptures this morning. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. It says, The word of God kept spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And so look what he calls. He says, People who are becoming obedient to the faith in Christ are called disciples. Not just the heavy hitters, not just the ones that are like, you know, not just like the 12 apostles or, you know, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy, not just the big guns, all of them were called disciples. The priests who were coming out of Judaism and getting faith in Christ also were becoming disciples of Jesus. And then when Paul gets saved, he wants to go to Jerusalem, and we find this later on in Acts chapter 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. They're not using the word Christians. They're using the word disciple, and that conjures up a very different picture. And even women are referred to as disciples. It says now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated into the Greek called Dorcas, who was a woman abounding with deeds of kindness and charity as she continually did. And so everyone that has faith in Christ is considered a disciple. 
And this kind of gets us away from hiding behind a very generic word called Christian and starts painting a different picture in our mind. But this is what the early church referred to themselves as. They didn't say we're Christians, they said we're disciples, we're followers. And so that leads to a huge question that we have to ask ourselves, and that is, are we disciples? Are we disciples? Or are we just comfortable by saying, you know, we're Christians? Because let's face it, I think it's like 78% of Americans refer to themselves as Christians which is absurd when you look at the condition our nation is in and the crazy belief structures that we have in our nations. So are we really disciples? So Jesus gets into this incredible conversation with his 11 disciples. Judas is betraying him. And this is right before his crucifixion, right before his death. And so his words are pretty powerful. I mean, he's been with them for three and a half years, but now it's time to really, you know, let the rubber meet the road. And now he's really kind of getting down to brass tacks. He's really giving them a lot of truths of things that they need to know. And he starts talking to them in the Gospel of John, verse 13, 33, chapter 13 and 33. He says this, he says, little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. All right, so they're not getting this concept. Jesus is basically saying, listen, guys, I'm going to die. Told you that from the beginning. I'm going to die, and then I'm going to go back to heaven. And you can't come. You're not, you're not coming with me this time. It's not like I'm going to Galilee, or I'm not going to Capernaum, or I'm not going, you know, I'm going someplace. You can't follow me. But in in light of this, he starts telling them what's so, so, so important. And he goes on in verse 34, and he says, a new commandment I give to you. Now, these are Jews, and they understood the Big Ten, right? Moses is the Jewish hero. He is the architect. He's the receiver of the law. He gets the Ten Commandments from God. They base their their political system, their economic system, their educational system, their finance system, everything in their, in their social stratus is based on the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to give a new commandment to you guys. And they're thinking, all right, lay us on us. That's what we need, like three things too, or you know, five points too, or you know, maybe another or ten, whatever, Jesus, you know, lay it on us. And Jesus said, I got a new commandment that you love one another. And, 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 you know, you can just imagine, like, like they're, they're thinking about this, and they're like, what? And, and they're probably also thinking, like, well, that's really not new. I mean, the Old Testament, you know, tells us that, that we should love one another. And then Jesus, you know, the drum roll starts coming up, and then Jesus just drops this on him, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he defines what he means when he says, love one another. This is the commandment I'm leaving you. I want you to love one another. All right. As I have loved you. Holy smokes. That just puts it like in a whole different league, doesn't it? I can just see like, you know, the disciples are like, what? And Jesus looks at Matthew and he's like, Matthew, Matthew, you remember when you were a tax gatherer? You are a traitor to your own people. You should have been stoned to death. You were a sellout to the Roman government. You were a tax gatherer. And I came to you and I said, man, I'm coming to your house and we're going to have dinner together. We're going to have a party at your house. And all these guys got totally ticked off at me and all the Pharisees got totally ticked off because I went to your house and I had dinner with you, an outsider, worse than a heathen. You remember that? He's like, yeah, how can I forget that? That's what I'm talking about. Nathaniel, you remember when you found out I was from Bethlehem and you, and you came off, you dissed my whole family and you said, oh, can anything good come out of Bethlehem, you know? And I forgave you from that. That's how I want you to love people. Peter, holy smokes, Peter, you remember when I said I have to die for the salvation of humanity and you said, no, you're not going to go to the cross? And I forgave you for that? John, you remember the time you guys were so upset you wanted to call fire down from heaven and burn up these other guys? You were that mad. And I forgave you from that and I got you through that. That's what I'm talking about. 
Guys, 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 do you remember Do you remember when I gave you that message about the whole drinking my blood and eating my flesh and all of you wanted to leave? All of you wanted to just leave me. And yet you came back and I forgave all of you. Do you remember that? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly how I want you to love one another. Just like that. I want you to be so filled with love that you get over things and that you forgive and that you learn to grow, that you hold one another accountable, but you're always walking in love. And then he goes on in verse 35 and he says this, by this, all men are going to know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. He didn't say, listen, you get the right bumper sticker on your car, people are going to get the idea. Listen, listen, you wear just the right cross and people see that, they're going to know you're my disciple. You go to this church or that church or whatever and people see that. You go to a restaurant, bow your head and pray, people see that, they're going to know you're my... He didn't say that. He said, if you love one another as I have loved you, that's what's going to cause people to know you're my disciples. Do you know what turned the, the, the Roman Greco world over to Christianity? It was because even though they started out hating them and not understanding them, they couldn't deny the love they had. Because these were the people that were willingly going into leper colonies. These were the people that were taking babies that were being left to die and caught and building orphanages. These were the people that were, you know, starting hospitals and caring centers. These were the people that were loving the unlovely people of society. And they couldn't get past the fact that they had no fear of death and they loved everybody all the time. And that began to change everybody's heart. Now, I just want you to know about like this loving one another as, as Jesus loved us. That's really hard to do in the megachurches. You know, nothing against megachurches. There's churches that are 30,000, 35,000, and we ooh and we awe ah them. But I want you to know that those are great coliseums where it's really easy to slip in and slip out and have nothing really impact your life. But in a smaller church where it's I know you, you know me, there's a level of accountability where this really works. Where we can say, I know you, and I know all about you, and I still choose to love you because you're my sister, you're my brother in Christ. And so Jesus just lays down this whopper of, of, of the whole kingdom principle. I love you, and I, I loved every one of you, and I want you to love one another as I've loved you. As I've been reading this book about heaven and all these near-death experiences and people who have gone there and just seen awesome unimaginable things one of the things that they all said is that the moment they died they were enveloped with an overwhelming overpowering love like they had never experienced before unconditional welcoming love and the closer that they got to the presence of god the light got brighter and the light just wasn't a tangible light that could be seen it was something that was felt as love Light and love. God is love. God is light. And so you can only imagine the love that God has. Everything they said in heaven just exuded both light and love everywhere. And Jesus is saying, this is my kingdom, man. This is the engine that runs my kingdom. This is the motor that runs my kingdom. My kingdom is a kingdom of love. The Jews thought it was all about Judaism and King David and Wahoo. And it's not. It has nothing to do with this planet or this thing. It's a kingdom of love. And if you want that, you've got to be a disciple. You've got to be a follower. It's not enough to just say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer. Or I got baptized once or, you know, whatever it might be. No, I'm on a journey. I'm on a path. I'm not going to look to the left. I'm not going to look to the right. I'm going to keep right on going. And Jesus drops this incredible teaching about my kingdom revolves around this concept of unconditional love. In the middle of that, there's Peter. You can just imagine Peter, right? There's Peter. You know, he's pondering all these words Jesus says. And so Peter comes up with this wonderful line. Lord, where are you going? That's the very next verse. 
right? Jesus started off by saying, hey, where I'm going, you can't go. And then he gets into this incredible teaching about this is the commandment of my kingdom. I want you to love one another just like I loved you I, because this is how people are going to know you're my disciples. And Jesus is like, where are you going? You know, and, and you're just like, oh, Peter, what a bonehead. Now you know why sometimes even Jesus said, Father, how long do I got to be with these guys? <laughs> Jesus is saying, I want you to allow people to just come in and see how you love one another. I want you to allow people to come into a fellowship of a church or a home group or a home Bible study and I want them to see how husbands love wives, how wives love husbands, how parents love children, how children love parents. I want, you, I want them to see how an employee loves an employer, an employer loves an employee. I want you to see how this thing works in life. This is what causes life to work. I want you to see how, uh, I want them to see how Christians love people who can't love back, how they love the sick, how they love widows, how they love those that are hurting, how they love the outsiders. I want, the, I want them to see that. Because discipleship revolves around love. And we need to rebrand the branding of the church and get it back to its original brand. You know what I mean? When you talk about brand recognition, like you talk about Nike sneakers, right? And they got their little swoosh trademark. And they've got their little motto, just do it. You know, and what does that think? It's like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to have to have the right shoes on. You know, so I'm going to wear Nike shoes and I'm just going to do it. And Jesus is saying, just love. Swoosh. Just love. I want you to love. What would it be like for the next eight weeks if we just said, I'm going to just start loving more? What would that look like? I mean, just right now, I don't want any you know, answers, but just in your own mind, in your own, in your own context, what would that look like if you intentionally said, I'm just going to try with the help of the Holy Spirit, to be more loving. I'm just going to love everybody around me as much as I can. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, Pastor, you don't realize I'm surrounded by idiots. You know, And we all think that we're, everybody's an idiot but us, right? I mean, that's the way we think. Everybody's an idiot like us. We get on a road, and it's like everyone's driving like a maniac but us. We're driving perfect. And, you know, so we think this. But what would it look like if we just said we're going to love them Anyway, because this is the atmosphere of heaven, and we need to start experiencing it and working it now because that's what it's going to be like for eternity. What would it be like to just love people? And you say, hmm, yeah, I suppose I could try that. I don't think it's going to be easy. Well, it did get Jesus crucified. What would it be like? The next eight weeks, next seven weeks, we're going to look at this subject of rebranding the church. What is a Christian? Because it's not what most people think it is. And what would it be like to just start saying, you know, I'm just going to choose to love. I'm going to hear this message in my mind's ear. When something happens, I'm just going to say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to love. I'm just going to take the high road and I'm going to love them. I want you to just look at this scripture. We'll close with this. Galatians 6, 1 through 5, verses 1 through 2 says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The word he uses here for trespass is like slipping on the ice. If any of you slips, like, you know, like almost no fault of your own, like you just get blindsided, moment of weakness, whatever, you slip on the ice, you who are spiritual, Restore that person. Don't sit there and say, oh, what are you doing? You should have known there was ice there, right? He's, he's saying, just restore them in a spirit, looking to yourself also, that you too will not be tempted. Then he says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what was the law of Christ that Jesus said? This is my law, this is my commandment, that you love one another. And so he's saying, listen, I want you to bear one another's burdens and demonstrate that love. And the word here in the Greek that's used for bearing a burden is to carry an overwhelming load. 
like something just, you know, everything just rains down on one person at one time and they are crushed under an overwhelming load because life is just doing that to them at that point in time. Because that's what happens to all of us, right? Sometimes life just hits us like a ton of bricks. And he's saying, listen, when that happens, I want you to, 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 in love, I want you to bear that burden with them, help them out through that. And then he goes on and he says this, if anyone thinks that he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Each one must examine his own work then he'll have reason and boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regards to another. So it's not like, well, I can look at other people and say, I'm not like that. Because didn't, that, didn't a Pharisee do that with, a, with a, 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 a sinner? God, I thank you, I'm not like him. And, and yet it was a sinner that went away justified because he was saying, God, I really am a basket case. I really am a mess. And so he's saying, listen, don't judge yourself compared to other people. Judge yourself by who the best you can be. Judge yourself, are you walking in love? Are you being a disciple? Are you really where you should be? Judge yourself by that, not by looking at outside people, because then you'll have reason to boast inside of yourself. And then he ends up saying this, each one has to bear his own load. Now we just got done talking about bear one another's burdens, and now he's saying bear your own load. Because the word here is the word backpack. The Roman soldiers would be outfitted with their, with their gear and they would have a backpack. They would carry their kit in and you know, different things in, extra clothing, things like that. And so he's saying, listen, in life, everybody's got responsibilities. And you're to bear your own responsibilities. Don't become a victim. Don't become poor me. Everybody's got to do something for me. You've got to buck up. You've got to bear your own burdens. But in the light of that, when somebody who is bearing their own burdens is overwhelmed and being crushed, come alongside of that person and help that person. Because that's what it means to be walking in love. That's what it means to be helping somebody. What do you do with somebody's disappointments? What do you do with your own disappointments, even in yourself? Eight weeks, an eight-week journey. What would it look like If I just said for the next eight weeks, God, help me be a disciple. Help me to rebrand my understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let me set aside the word Christian for eight weeks and look at the word disciple. And let me start off by saying, God, help me to walk in love. Help me to be a person that reflects and resonates love. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask God that by the power of your Holy Spirit, because the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would pour out in our hearts an abundance of love, an overwhelming abundance of love. And that God, we would be remindful of this message all week long. And when we hear the leading of your Spirit saying, now, this is a great time for you to take the high road. This is a great time for you to respond in love. Let us die to self. Let's take up our cross. And let's do what's being required of us and experience what it really means to be a disciple of Christ. Because there are aspects of your divine nature. There are aspects of our fellowship with you that we cannot know in any other way unless we go down the paths of that you direct us in. And so help us in these things, we pray. And that by doing this, 2017 will start off by being one of the greatest years ever, one of the most Jesus years we've ever experienced. And we thank you for all of these things in his name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen.